Well, I haven't put out a video for a while because I've been uh, starting up a company making um, hurdy-gurdies, which are strange musical instruments. These are parts of the crank handles, the paint just drying there. Um, but I'm back on the car, and as you can see, I've not been doing nothing to it. Um, I've, um, if you remember the last episode, I had the engine mounted. I've got my engine mounts in the right place, so I've taken the engine out. And I've put my muck-up bodywork sections at one foot intervals slotted onto the chassis. Okay, this just, has just arrived. Um, I snatched it out of the hands of the delivery guy before uh, he rang the doorbell. Car guys watching this will know exactly what I mean. Um, sometimes you've just got to spend a bit of money, I'm afraid, and uh, to get the right things. So this is... What is this? This is, uh, this, these are the back plates and uh, brake pad set up for juice brakes or hydraulic brakes. As you can see there's a fairly conventional system there with fairly conventional adjusters. And the usual springs, not sure what these are, I'm sure I'll find out. And these and the springs to hold the brake shoes, all looks pretty conventional. Um, what's this? What else do we get? Oh yeah, so then there's the, the internal mechanisms. All quite beefy. Um, what's in here? I'm trying to do this with one hand. Are these the cylinders? Ah! Look at that, hydraulic cylinders. That's what we want, isn't it? And then the shoes, but underneath the shoes you'll see we have back plates. We might even have instructions, surely not. Oh yeah. There we are. Back plates, you see. Now the only thing they say is uh, when I bought these from O'Neill's vintage Ford spares in the UK is because these have been stamped uh, of this edge going straight up and across like that it's a bit of a curve on it you sometimes have to uh, bevel the edges of the ends of the axles where they bolt on here just for it to fit nicely and you can actually do it with an angle grinder or maybe more subtly with a flap disc um, yeah you just need to take a little bit of material off just put a bit of, an angle, bit of a kind of taper on the rim where it bolts in there but apart from that it's supposedly complete bolt-on kit and you can use your original drums and um, because these pads are one and three quarter width inches in width would I better, which I better just check they're supposed to be that roughly uh, yeah they are one and three quarters yeah so all that's good so far so the next job is to fit these and see if they uh, they do actually go on and work as they should I've sprayed etch primer two or three coats of black clear coat onto these backing plates and very nice they look too um, if we just test fit them if you can see them if you can see that It's hard to do with one hand but it's a very close fit it just needs tapping on or maybe just sanding slightly on the inside of this centre ring um, I read somewhere that you might need to, to take an angle grinder to parts of the end here um, because if you look, these edges there, they're, they're not vertical, they're kind of going as a, as a slight taper. But in fact, it's fine, there's loads of clearance, so that's not a problem. Um, so I'm just going to sand, clean up the inside of this and just test that it does fit all the way on before I start fitting some of the parts to this. Now the first thing you fit is this anchor pin. And it comes with this spacer. 
And it says if you're using the one and three quarter shoes, install the provided pin spacer to the outside of the backing plate. Well, these shoes are one and, a, one and three quarter inches. So, um, hard to film this with one hand. If I put that through there. There, you can see this. Presumably the spacer goes there, then the washer, and then the giant nut. Um, what it doesn't actually say is if you're using two inch shoes, I assume you put the spacer on the inside, so that this pin is just a little bit more that way. Anyway, I'm not. I'm using one and three quarters, so I'm going to assemble it like that. The next step is the, the wheel cylinders. Um, that's where the brake pipe will go in. That's the bleed screws so that needs to be at the top. These are the mounting points so that goes through there. Um, the only thing it does say is the brake line should port should be towards the rear of the car. So in fact, um, Because of the side this is, is and because that's where the handbrake cable will come in from the front of the car um, and it's going to be on that side of the car so the rear of the car is that way so in fact I need this cylinder to go there so I'll bolt that in next okay so that's done so there we are what's next brake shoes star wheel adjuster star wheel adjuster spring okay right something to note here um if you look at the the shape of this part all the cutouts and holes and everything they're the same for all the shoes but you'll notice that some of the shoes have a shorter band of friction material there than this shoe for example see where it goes all the way up to there compared to that one and the shorter one is the so-called leading shoe or front shoe. So bearing in mind the front of the car's that way with this uh, backing plate. I've actually got these the wrong way around. I need to put them that way. And you'll have to Google why there's a leading shoe and a trailing shoe. Um, but there, there is a kind of scientific reason for it. So there we are, so we've got the one with the, the smaller amount of brake material is uh, towards the front of the car. So that's good, we'll carry on now and try and get some of the linkages in. So these are the, I don't know what the correct name is, they're the pushy things. So the hydraulic cylinder moves out there and out there, pushes on that, and that slot goes there. So we need to push these into the each end of the cylinder slave cylinder so that's done um, as you push these in you can feel the piston moving in a bit the same this side so the, uh, the slot there like that goes each side of this metal metal here so the next thing is to fit the star adjuster and the spring that pulls them together right for those that don't know this is a star adjuster it goes in there and you poke a screwdriver through the back of the hair through this slot and by turning the star see how it as it unscrews that distance gets wider so basically you can turn it until the it pushes the brake shoes out that way till the drum just starts to bind and then you back it off just a tiny bit um, and of course in really old cars they always seize up so you have to lubricate this really well. Um, it's very similar to the system found in Volkswagen, old air cool Volkswagens, Beetles and things. Um, some later cars had a kind of weird cable and ratchet system which as you pressed the brake pedal it would automatically turn this and adjust it automatically taking up the wear in the pad. But on really old cars you just you just basically poke a screwdriver through here and manually adjust it. These are a lot chunkier than the VW ones, so uh, I don't know, that might be a good thing. Anyway, I'm going to assemble it. So you might ask, what's to stop this 
just winding itself back in again. Well, I've done this like in the picture and it looks like the spring actually just rubs against it. So as you turn it, it goes pop, pop, pop and the, sp the spring just locks it. Um, I actually put this, I actually undid that shoe there and had it over here, which brought this whole cross here a bit, which made the spring easier to put in. And then I um, opened these two out again and clipped them back under here like that. Um, but there's different ways to do it. Right, now the next thing are these little pins that go through here into the backing plate which stop it all popping off this way. So these are pretty much like on any old car, you put the pin through through the hole in the back uh, like that, up through here and then you take your spring and this cap and you push it on like that and then twist it half a turn and it sits there and of course what happens is it, uh, these are just cheap steel that's been stamped out so they rust out and then they don't hold the pins anymore um, but it looks as if they've given me a couple of spare ones which is nice of them so I'll just do this side now as well okay next thing is to fit these springs um, you'll notice there's a correct kind of way around that this loops over here so it doesn't rub on this and then it loops around here they both loop around there And that helps return the springs um, but first that goes on there like that then these hook on right change of plan I'm going to put these these springs need pulling really hard to get them to loop over the here so I'm actually going to fit this to the car to the axle um, otherwise I'm going to literally just pull it off the bench or scratch it um, so it'll give me something more solid to anchor it to when I'm putting tension on that spring to get it over here. So I'm going to bolt this on now. Right, if you remember from the previous design as it were, this thing fits here and it catches any gunge or leaky oil or grease or anything else in that little tray at the bottom. It stops it dripping onto the drum and then contaminating the pad. So I'd like to keep it um, but you can see the top of it fouls the cylinder but um, stuff tends to fall downwards so I'm just going to trim the top a little bit um, just grind just grind away a little bit at the top here and then it should fit okay right so I've cut that little piece out with a hacksaw and a, a dremel a cutting disc You see it well now. It'll now fit without fouling the master cylinder, sorry, slave cylinder. So I'm just going to put a bit of paint on those raw edges and then come back and carry on. So these circles were cut for me by somebody who makes internal panels for um, motorhome furniture and um, he's got this massive CNC controlled router that will cut eight before sheets of ply so um, he kindly cut these circles for me which match the ones I've designed on my computer and you can see they slot down into the chassis rails and they're at one foot intervals apart from this one which is one and a half feet because if you remember I, I stretched the frame slightly at this point so I've had to cut these a little bit to get them in and they're just numbered 1 to 13 and there's actually another one that goes here and a small one that goes there the same at the back but it's good because it allows me to get a mental idea of what I've got to make in terms of bodywork. Um, 
there'll be a fairing this won't stick up as much as this there'll be a fairing piece that comes down here like that like you see on lots of belly tank racers um, so the question is do I form my body panels on this you know I can semi permanently fix them and I can um, bolt or glue in spacers so it's more rigid I just use this as my actual template for the body panels and then flip it over and do the underside um, which would save space in the workshop so I've not actually decided yet I may actually um, do the back half separately so take these off and build a wooden former uh, put my engine back in um, but the front's more complex and it's got to fit around these tubes so I may make the front on the car if you like you fixing these where they are for now um, and I may just make a wooden butt from these for the for the rear the rear um, engine fairing if you like um, so yeah and then the next thing is how how am I actually going to make the aluminium panels I've got an English wheel um, I'll probably need to buy some more tools stretching shrinking tools that kind of thing um, because for example I could do it like an aircraft I could actually have um, C-shaped T-section aluminium rings hoops if you like with stringers going between them just like the tail of an aircraft and then actually use quite small sections of aluminium riveted on uh, and build it up um, into one whole thing that comes off um, or as they um, form large panels and seam weld them together which although not easy is possible for aluminium um, and I think what's going to guide me with that is um, my welding I'm going to have to get lots of scrap aluminium and practice seam welding it I've got the correct equipment to do it I've got an AC TIG welder um, but there's definitely a bit of an art to that so the thing is to practice that and see how good or bad I am at it because that will influence the technique I use to actually build this up um, it would be quite tempting to actually build it like an old aircraft tail section um, with the, the little hoops um, I could even fix them to the wood um, and use that as the kind of you know structure to hold it all in the correct orientation and when I pop rivet the panels on and then remove the wood from underneath so uh, yeah plenty of options then I do I use flush rivets or do I use period correct domed ones in which case you end up with billions of rivets um, which might look quite cool in a retro kind of way um, so and I don't know if Am I even allowed to use flush rivets? I mean, they were, they did exist pre-war. I um, have to do some more research. So I think I'm going to have to hit the computer, do some research, look at techniques for building aircraft, fuselages, um, old school. Um, see if anybody near to me actually builds aircraft um, like that. It'd be good to see it being done in the flesh you know um, so I, I need to do a whole ton of research and then decide how I'm going to do it but also practice seam welding aluminium plates just to see how good or probably really bad I am at doing that so for the moment my engine is back on its test stand um, crammed in the corner and uh, to tidy up the mess here with the jigsaw and um, go from there.